So we are going to be in Numbers chapter 4, and we're at some point tonight going to try to work our way all the way through Numbers chapter 4, reading it. There's a lot of verses there, not as many hard names, which is a great gift <laughs> tonight, not quite as many hard names, uh, but I want you to get the, the main idea. Let's start out by reading verses uh, maybe 1 through 4, and then I think we're going to skip over to the end of the chapter, then I'll pray for us and get us started, and then we'll come back around and catch all the verses. So let's, let's start at the beginning of the chapter, Numbers chapter 4, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi by their clans and their father's houses, from 30 years old, old up to 50 years old, all who can come on duty to do the work in the tent of meeting. This is the service of the sons of Koath in the tent of meeting, the most holy things. Dot, dot, dot. We're going to fill in what those duties are. Okay, now go to the end of the chapter. And let's pick up here in verse 46. All those who were listed of the Levites, verse 46, whom Moses and Aaron and the chiefs of Israel listed by their clans and their fathers' houses, from 30 years old, old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come to do the service of ministry and the service of bearing burdens in the tent of meeting, those listed were 8,580. According to the commandment of the Lord through Moses, they were listed, each one with his task of serving or carrying. Thus they were listed by him as the Lord commanded Moses. Let me pray for us just for a moment. We'll get started. Father, thank you for the gift of hymns, the gift of a church gathered together to sing together. Father, thank you for the ministry that's happening tonight with our teenagers as they get together. Uh, thank you for the kids, the sixth graders gathered together learning about missions. Father, thank you for the women's ministry event next Sunday night. That's such a wonderful event, and so many ladies invite their friends to come and, and connect with the church. We're thankful for that. Teach us tonight from the book of Numbers more about who we are to be as your people and, and what you've called us to do, who you've called us to be. God, lead us in that, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So out of curiosity, how many of you have been a part of a church where every Sunday you had to set up and tear down to, to have church together? Has anybody been a part of a church plant where you had to do that before? Now, some of your Sunday school glasses still have to set up and tear down every Sunday, so you still get, get that experience. So, I'll tell you a little bit, uh, you may know this piece of my story, or you may not, but piece, I'll piece some of this together for you. So, Amanda and I graduate college in 2004, 2005, we moved down to New Orleans, go through Hurricane Katrina in August 2005, get back on our feet with Henderson Hills Baptist Church in Edmond, up on I-35. They were the church that helped us get back on our feet after Hurricane Katrina. We go back down to New Orleans to finish up the master's degree program there at the seminary. When we finished that, I was just burnt out on school. I just thought, I don't know if I could keep going. Amanda was like, no, keep doing the PhD program. And I was like, I've, I've just got to have to have a break. Um, God, by his kindness, allowed us to go back to New Orleans later. But we had a year break where Henderson Hills, 2007, 2008, brought us back to Oklahoma because they were going to start a multi-site campus up in Stillwater. This is when churches were trying to start campuses in different locations. And so you had Henderson Hills in Edmond there on I-35. They were going to start a Henderson Hills Stillwater and so my job was going to be to be the campus pastor there at, in Stillwater. So Amanda and I, we moved to Stillwater in 2007, 2008. They would record the Saturday night service in Edmond, put it on a DVD. The music guy would drive it to Stillwater on Sunday, and I was the spiritual MC who would put the DVD in and start it and say, watch that, and then I'd come up and give the invitation at the end. So that was kind of, was kind of how that worked. But we met in elementary school. And so every Sunday, we had these big crates that had been made for the purpose of storing all of our material in there. All the kids' ministry things would go in there, all the music equipment in, went in there, everything we needed to set up. So every Sunday, about 5.30, we had a big truck that we would pull up there, load those crates onto it, take it to the elementary school, set up for church. 
Some of you, just even me telling that story, brings back all these <laughs> memories. And try. It's hard. It sounds really fun at the beginning, and, and it really does bring a group of people together because of having to do it, but wow, it wears on you. And so Easter Sunday morning uh, of the one year, I think they've cut me out of the record at Henderson Hills because of <laughs> this, this one year and everything that went down, but Easter Sunday of, of this year, I get the crate, and it's a big, huge crate, and I, and I take it out onto the sidewalk there in, in downtown Stillwater where we were storing this, and I turn around to go back and lock the office door, and I turn back around, and my cart has taken off down, down the sidewalk, and it crashes into a guy's truck right there on, uh, on Main Street in Stillwater. And I just looked at it and thought, Lord, is this what ministry is supposed to be? <laughs> like, this is not what I signed up for when I came to, came to lead, this, lead this church. And so, the, you know, you would think Easter Sunday, like, this guy's going to be really understanding. Like, young man, it's going to be okay. He was not understanding. He, he was not up that morning to celebrate Easter. Let me just say, let me just say that. So, uh, anyway, we had to pay to fix this vehicle and, and all that. And then a few months later, they sent me back to New Orleans to do the PhD program. So that was the, uh, that was the end of my setup and tear down. So I say that to say, when I read through this passage, it brought back all kinds of memories about doing set up and tear down church because Numbers chapter 4 in your Bible, it's set up and tear down church. It is the story of how the people took apart the tabernacle, moved it to another location, set up the tabernacle, and when the tower of smoke and the tower of fire moved on, they're like, oh, here we go again, Lord. And they would put it all back, you know, take it down, put it together, take it to the next place. Some of you who've had to move a lot, you know that feeling of what it's like? Oh, here we go again. We're going to box it up. We're going to move, move to a no, new location. So what we're going to see in these verses is the process of tearing down the tabernacle, taking it to a new location, setting it back up. And if we can do this right, we're going to also come out of it with some bigger lessons, some bigger pictures about what does the Lord want to teach us through a story like this. First, Let's back up and work our way through Numbers 4, and then we're going to try to draw some implications uh, from this passage for our own lives and for our church. Okay, let me reread verses 1 through 4. Now that you have an idea, this is set up and tear down church. That's what Numbers 4 is all about. The Lord spoke, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, by their clans and their father's houses from 30 years old up to 50 years old. Obviously, they didn't trust people under the age of 30 to tear down and set up, which I can testify that was a good decision <laughs> not to do that. You had to be between 30 and 50. Old enough to make wise decisions, but also young enough to still do the labor. So 30 to 50 was the, was the range. Verse 4, this is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tent of meeting. They are in charge of the most holy things. So think about the interior part of, of the tabernacle. When the camp is to set out, Aaron and the son shall go in and take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Okay, just a moment so you get the picture here. Big piece of paper. I'm going to try to remember to mute my mic every time I have to sniffle, so I apologize for that. But uh, you can see on the left side, if you orient your paper, you can see the veil. And the verse numbers are in, are in parentheses, which is a really nice feature of this, of this diagram. So verse 5 there in reference to the veil. This is the same veil, the same piece of equipment that was torn at the crucifixion of Jesus. So this is the veil. This is the primary veil. Well, let me back up. There, there are good Christian scholars that disagree with that assessment. I think, though, this is the clear indication that's given us. This is the veil that was torn when, when, when Jesus died. And it talks about that veil being torn from top to bottom. So this, this primary veil here was the first piece of equipment taken down. And if you imagine in your mind, they're going to take it down, and then they're just going to lay it directly over the ark. Why is that the case? Because never will anyone be able to access or see the ark. It's a protective measure. It is the very first, and it's just this really amazing picture as you think about them taking down this huge veil and leaning it over and wrapping the ark in it. And so it's another sign of that holiness and the protection that's, that's involved there. 
When you get to verse verse 6, after they cover the ark with it, verse 6 says, then they shall, shall put on it a covering of goat skin. Does anyone have a note in their Bible, if it's a study Bible, does anybody have a note next to goat skin or another translation of goat skin there in, in verse 6? Badger? Yeah. Porpoise, yes. Those are the most common. I have a nice little note at the bottom of my Bible that says the meaning of this Hebrew word is uncertain. <laughs> so that's how much scholars struggle with this, with this particular word. Some people say goat skin. Some people say badger skin. Some people say porpoise skin. And some translations will just say the orange-yellow uh, material or the orange-brown material. Scholars are having it. There's just no consensus on what type of skin is, is referenced here. The key point, though, is it's not going to be the same color as the veil, or it's not going to be the same color. It's a different type of material that's laid on at this point. So what happens with that in, in verse 6, that covering of goat skin, it is spread on top of that a, a cloth olive blue, and shall put in its poles, these poles that were used to carry the ark from one place to the other. You might remember the story, 2 Samuel 6, I believe, there's the story there where Uzzah reaches out to try to catch the ark as it's falling. What happens to him? Does everybody congratulate him for what he, no, no, he's overstepped his boundaries. He reaches out and touches the ark, and, and that's the end. There is this incredible holiness that's devoted here and these poles that were used to carry it from one place to another are put into place here verse 7 over the table of the bread of the presence they shall pr spread a cloth of blue now you may be picking up on something here blue cloth is used for the most holy items the, so if it what they do how many of you, when you've moved from one place to the other, you've color-coded your boxes? Like those of you who are really just organized and impressive, and you're like, this is going to go in the kitchen. This is going to go in the bedroom. This. So they would color-code these things with cloth as they moved from one place to the next, and blue designated the most holy items. And so you'll start to see a little bit of, of that process going on here. They're going to spread a cloth of blue over it and put on it the plates the dishes for incense, the bowls, the flagons or, or jars for the drink offering, the regular showbread also shall be put on it. Verse 8, then they shall spread over them a cloth of scarlet and cover the same with a covering of goat skin or badger skin or porpoise skin or <laughs> whatever it might be and shall put in its poles. Then verse 9, they shall take a cloth of blue and cover the lampstand for the light with its lamps, its tongs, its trays, and all the vessels for oil with which it's supplied. Verse 10, they shall put, uh, put it with all its utensils and a covering of goatskin and put it on the carrying frame. And over the golden altar, they shall spread a cloth of blue and cover it with a covering of goatskin and shall put in its poles. Verse 12, they shall take all the vessels of the service that are used in the sanctuary and put them in a cloth of blue and cover them with a covering of goatskin and put them on the carrying frame and they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. This is random, but verse 13 makes me think of my dad grilling back in the day, you know, when it was just the basic charcoal grill, not the super fancy grills we have now, but just that basic one and how all the ash would gather in the bottom and you would release it, it would all fall down on the ground. I remember as a kid being, being fascinated by that. I don't think that's what this looked like, but it's just, it's just kind of what comes to mind. Also, Jaren, this is unbelievably embarrassing. Could you go to the restroom and get me like some tissue or a paper towel or, or something like that? I am, it, it really is. I'm so sorry. <sighs> We're going to talk in a moment, Jaron, about like doing like really minor things for the Lord, like doing the little, like you present the showbread or the, uh, <laughs> or the Kleenexes. <sighs> Goodness, so sorry. Okay, verse 14. And they shall put on it all the utensils of the altar, which are used for the service there. The fire pans, the forks, the shovels, the basins, all the utensils of the altar. And they shall spread on it a covering of goat skin, and shall put in its poles. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary, and all the furnishings of the sanctuary as the camp sets out, we're in the middle of 15. After that, the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these 
but they must not touch the holy things lest they die. These are the things of the tent of meeting that the sons of Koath are to carry. If you think about an example here, or just trying to understand what's, what's happening, the priest would have to gather up and box up or, or put cloth over everything, and then the other sons of Koath would come in, and they would pick them up and take them to another location. Again, think about moving in your own home. There are certain things when you move, you want to be the one to box them up. Like, you're not going to trust anybody else to box those things up. Like, you're going to box them up, and then when the moving company gets there, they can move the boxes, but they're not going to put the things in the boxes. That's what's happening here. The most holy items, only the priests can handle those items. Only they can box them up, and then the others are going to come along, and and they're going to carry them to, to the next location. Okay, verse 16. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, shall have charge of the oil for the light, the fragrant incense, the regular grain offering, and the anointing oil, with the oversight of the whole tabernacle and all that is in it, of the sanctuary and its vessels. So verse 17, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Let not the tribe of the clans of the Kohathites be destroyed from among the Levites, but deal thus with them, that they may live and not die when they come near to the most holy things. Aaron and his sons shall go in and appoint them each to his task and to his burden, but they shall not go in to look on the holy things even for a moment, lest they die. Whew, you think they took that seriously? Like he is doing everything he can to protect the moving guys from getting killed in this situation. He's saying only the priests handle that, only they deal with those things. Your role is going to come later. You're going to have a different role to play in this. Okay, verse 21. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take a census of the sons of Gershon also, by their fathers' houses, and by their clans. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, we've heard that before, verse 23, we're familiar with that, you shall list them, all who can come to do the duty, to do service in the tent of meeting. This is the service of the clans of the Gershonites, in serving and bearing burdens. They shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle, and the tent of meeting with its covering, and the covering of goat skin that is on top of it, and the screen for the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the hangings of the court, and the screen for the entrance of the gate of the court that's around the tabernacle and the altar, and their cords and all the equipment for their service, and they shall do all that needs to be done with regard to them. That's a great phrase. Just do whatever it takes. Just do all that needs to be done. Verse 27. All the service of the sons of the Gershonites shall be at the command of Aaron and his sons, in all that they are to carry, and in all that they have to do. And you shall assign to their charge all that they are to carry. This is the service of the clans of the sons of the Gershonites in the tent of meeting, and their guard duty is to be under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Maybe just one quick comment there. You think, oh, they're just carrying around the cloth or the screens. You carry around huge amounts of cloth, uh, it's incredibly heavy what was involved in carrying these items from one place to the next. And so the Gershonites are in charge of the screens and the cloth and all these, all these coverings. Now, finally, verse 29, we get our last group here. As, from the, as for the sons of Merari, you shall list them by their clans and their father's houses. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, we're familiar with that now, verse 30, you shall list them. Everyone who can come on duty to do the service of the tent of meeting. And this is what they are charged to carry as the whole of their service in the tent of meeting. The frames of the tabernacle with the bars, pillars, and bases. And the pillars around the court with their bases and pegs and cords with all their equipment and all their accessories. And you shall list by name the object that they're required to carry. This is the service, verse 33, of the clans of the sons of Merari the whole of their service in the tent of meeting, under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the high priest, or the priest. And Moses and Aaron and the chiefs of the congregation listed the sons of the Kohathites by their clans and their father's houses. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, everyone who could come on duty for service in the tent of meeting. Verse 36 says, those listed were 2,750. This was the list of the clans of the Kohathites, all who served in the tent of meeting whom Moses and Aaron listed according to the commandment of the Lord by Moses. Now what's going to happen in the next two sections here is all the wording is going to be repeated except for the names and the numbers. So in the next section from 38 down to 41, 
it's the Gershonites, and there were 2,630 of them. And then 42 down to 45, the, the clan of Morari, there are 3,200. And then you finally get down there to verse 46. When you add all of them up, verse 48 said, those listed were 8,580. And according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses, they were listed. Each one, verse 49 says, each one had his task of serving or caring. Thus they were listed by him as the Lord commanded Moses. Oh, goodness. Should have hit mute. Okay, on your half sheet of paper here. Up at the top, uh, my professor, um, who had done some work on the book of Numbers, up here at the top, overview of Numbers 4, it says, The Levites do what appears to be menial, menial labor, maintenance, guarding, packing, hauling, but all of it is honorable and vitally important because it is for the divine king. If you're trying to draw some lessons or some applications from Numbers chapter 4, there's a couple of things that stand out. Number one, just remembering the holiness that's involved with the Lord, how protective they are of the most holy things, the fact that not everyone just comes and touches. There, there's a deep sense of holiness in a life devoted to the Lord. And so that idea of holiness that's prominent in the book of Numbers is, is all over this chapter. Also, uh, for those of us who love a good spreadsheet and a good to-do list and everything packed in a good box, uh, this is another picture of orderliness and, and the value in the kingdom of God of things existing in order and people having different roles that they play and different tasks that are carried out. And when God calls his people together, they have different tasks that they're called to do. If you're looking for a New Testament connection to this, I think almost certainly a 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or Romans chapter 12 that speaks of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how God gives to us different spiritual gifts, gives to a different callings that we're, that we're called to in, in life and in the church, and how every one of those is empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is so careful in 1 Corinthians 12 to say just because one gift or one role seems less in the eyes of the Lord, it has even greater honor than, than all the others. And so what it reminds us in the church is someone might have a role that they play, and it seems very minor, but in the eyes of the Lord, it absolutely matters. It has value and honor in the kingdom of God. And so when I think about Numbers chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, those are the kind of passages we think about connecting. And then kind of the final application and what I wanted to, to talk about here on the, the bottom part of the notes is just the value of doing the work that God has called us to do. What does it mean to do this work that God has called us to? And there's some language here that actually connects back to the book of Genesis. And you guys know anytime we can connect numbers or any of these other books back to Genesis, we want to make that connection. So the one place I would ask you to turn in your Bible tonight other than Numbers 4 is back to Genesis chapter 2. I want to make this connection for us. Because I think this is something um, that gets lost in church sometimes. And, and we can all, you know, this is not uh, all of us just yelling about the, uh, the younger people that aren't in here. But you'll see the connection. You'll see when this, why this matters. Um, it, it, it's a good lesson for all of us to hear. What we're connecting back to is Genesis chapter 2, starting around verse 15, where God takes uh, the man and puts him in the Garden of Eden. So, verse 15 of Genesis 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, quick note there. What two themes do you see here in Genesis chapter 2? Number one, the value of work. And number two, the importance of holiness. And you're like, oh, where have I seen the value of work and the importance of holiness? Ah, Numbers chapter 4. Like, that's, that's Numbers chapter 4 right there. God gives them the work to do. says, go and do this work, and you must be holy in how you do this work. That's the kind of background that's going on here. And then verse 18, just to top it off. The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper 
fit for him. So there's others that are going to be gathered around to do this work that God, God is called to do. As God, God's called Adam and Eve to do. Here's the point I would make for you. Work is not a curse. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the creation that God has given us, in the world that God has given us, to go and to do work with our hands or work with our words or work with whatever God has given us, to do that work, it's a good thing. It's a part of God's original creation before the fall. Now, the effort that we put into work and the results of our work and all of those things we know are corrupted by the fall. You get into Genesis 3 and you see that. But even as we think about the new creation into, into the future, in a very real sense, in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, work will be part of that. Now, now work in a sense like that work that just brings full glory to God and, and fills your heart is going to be that. One of the things I try to teach my kids, and you teach your kids and your grandkids, is work is not a curse. <laughs> like, work is not a bad thing. When we go to work, we are doing the work of the Lord. Now, what your work looks like changes as your season of life change. Uh, some of you may be in here, and you're not going to work in a vocational sense, but you have work that God has called you to, and that's good. That is a good and right thing, and we want to do that work that God's called us to do, and we want to do it with holiness, pursuing the Lord, pursuing what, he, what he's called us to. A couple of verses there, we aren't going to look at all of them, but Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, those are those verses that remind us we've been saved by grace through faith. This is not of ourselves. It's, it's, a, it's a work of God, and we're not boasting about it. It also reminds us that we are God's creation. We are created in Christ for good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. So God has prepared work for us to do, that that is a good thing from the Lord. I love Matthew chapter 25. I use this verse with my kids quite a bit, but Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. When we are faithful with the little things, the Lord sees that. I have no doubt about that. And when we're faithful with the little things, we're moved on to other things. We live in a world, we understand this, where everyone wants to get promoted like to the top immediately <laughs> and never go through the process of being faithful with the little things, never go through the process of just doing the work that, that builds you up. And so these verses remind us, let me say it this way. If you were to ever send a grandkid to me, or a kid to me, or a, a, a friend that's in high school, or, or early in life, one of the questions that I get a lot as a pastor is just the question, can you help me know God's will for my life? Can you help me understand like what I'm supposed to do, and how do I make decisions about what to do next in life? It's one of the most common questions I get, especially from our teenagers and college students. Every time I give them the same answer, on this, and, and I feel like the Lord has done this work in my own life, and I think it, it's just helpful for them. If somebody ever comes and says, how do I know God's will for my life? Number one, pursue holiness with everything you have. Um, the more your heart is devoted to the Lord, the more you're seeking to live for him in holiness, the more your, your mind and your heart's going to be open to the Lord's direction. Who you become <laughs> as a person is way more important than just these little things that you're asking about. Because most people, when they say, what is God's full will for my life? They want to know, where do I move? What job do I have? Who do I marry? Those things matter. More importantly is who you're becoming, that you're growing in holiness. So that's what I always tell them, number one. Number two, I always tell them, be completely faithful right where God has placed you. So if you're working at HTO, make the best sweet tea around. <laughs> if, if you're doing custodial work somewhere, clean things the very best you can. If, if you're doing yard, yard work, mow those yards to the glory of the Lord. The more you are faithful to the little things that God has put in front of you, he just has a way of opening the next door and the next door and the next door and, and guiding your path along the way. And so what we're going to do in the kingdom of God is we are going to do what it says down here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. And if you skip down a little bit under the next heading, second bullet point, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Peter 4, 
Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Okay, let's try to wrap all this up here so you don't have to listen to me sniffle anymore. Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4. Let's take down, set up church. It's take apart the tabernacle, move it to the next place. What does it teach us? It reminds us of the importance of holiness among the people of God, and it reminds us of doing what God has called us to do. Whatever you have been gifted to do, whatever God has put in front of you, that you would do it for his honor and his glory. And so we talked for a minute there about the high school and college kids that are seeking God's will for your life. I hope that you are seeking God's will for your life until the moment you take your last breath. God, what are you calling me to do? What, do you, what have you put in front of me? Okay, how can I know God's will for my life? Pursue holiness with everything you have and be completely faithful to what God has put in front of you. Even if it seems so small and so trivial, and God, this just doesn't amount to very much. Oh, it does in his kingdom. <laughs> it absolutely does in his kingdom. I mean, you deliver Kleenexes with the, for the glory of God. <laughs> like you do, you do whatever you can. Whatever God has put in front of you, God, I want to do that in a way that honors you. And as we do that work together, who receives the glory for that? The Lord does. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the book of Numbers. Um, thank you for just explanation about how your people moved the tabernacle from one place to another. And God, we think about what an incredible engineering project that would have been, uh, just the coordination it would have required among, among the people to be able to take down the tabernacle, to do it in a way that preserved your holiness, and then to move it to the next place and set it back up. And God, I'm sure the people that did that work, they probably thought, does this matter why am I just carrying the poles and not doing something else? God, I know they must have dealt with those things. Um, but God, we are reminded that you have given us things to do in your kingdom. And so we want to pursue those with holiness. And God, I pray if there's someone in here tonight, maybe they've come here tonight and they're just discouraged because they feel like what they've been doing doesn't matter a whole bunch or they feel discouraged because they're not doing as much as they wish they were doing. God, I pray that they would be encouraged tonight just to be faithful to what you placed in front of them. Whatever is in front of them, God, that they would do it with everything they have for your glory. And God, that they would trust you to bless that and that you would lead them to whatever is next. So God, help us to be faithful this week to what you put in front of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.